What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to Fudge Muppet. This is the Elder Scrolls Podcast. I'm Scott, here with Michael and Drew, as always. And today we are talking all about the great houses of Morrowind. So, where do we want to start? Let's pick one of the five, because we're going to sort of touch on the sixth house a little bit later, and we might have to do that in an individual video, because there's a lot of metaphysical cool stuff with that going on with Dagoth Ur. So which of the five well, I mean, would we start a with? A good like tiny little preface to, to put in there, I guess you could say, is that this kind of wasn't, you know, they, the great house structure was kind of unique to Morrowind in that when, you know, the Kaima people, the changed ones made their exodus across all the, you know, all the way from Somerset to Morrowind, they were following free day, the good Daedra, Boethia, Azura and Mafala. And, um, you know, largely because of Mafala's sphere of kind of like, the web of intricate, you know, plots going on over here, all of this stuff like that. It kind of, um, they showed them how to structure their society in a much different way, which is what led to these five, six great houses. Mm. But mm. although if you think about it, it's not crazy different to another province in the sense of, you know, there's a bunch of factions and they all form together to have a kind of overarching council that rules things. And as we know, they're also very... Uh, I guess, easy to be corrupted like any other province's well, wh government one is. One thing too, we don't actually get like an exact formulation because they obviously say like the good Daedra uh, taught them the ways to structure things. But at the same time, the Kaima came across into what they call Resdane, which is um, modern day Morrowind. And they had a period called like high velocity culture where they were basically, and that's when you see those like Daedric ruins and stuff in Morrowind. Like these were the... Um, places that they had their establishments and so on. And then they would start, um, at one point, they had sort of like a degradation of their society and so on. And then they ended up kind of, you know, whittling down into sort of like a Ashland estate, like a lot of the ancient Kaima around the time of um, Nerevar's rise and the Nordic conquests and stuff like that. They were living much closer to um, the Ashlanders that by comparison to like modern Dunma kind of things. Yeah, like they're like more tribes that then yeah. became these big houses and civilizations and, with very distinct cultures from one another over time. And, and like the houses too are, there are lots of houses. The great houses are simply just the houses that got the most power and influence and that are sort of the dominant ones. Like there are plenty like, you know, like House Mora or House Yeah, we well, even had the House Dwemer, you know, where they were kind of like extended that as a branch mm. so that they could yeah. improve their relations with the underground dwellers who kind of preceded them. Yeah. And we know that House Sadras, we don't know much about mm. them at all, but we know that they're one of the um, great houses now. Yeah, well, they yeah. replaced Hlalu, who were obviously, they were very, yeah. you know, they were um, sympathetic to the imperial cosmopolitan ideals. And, you know, when when things went kind of bad in the in the fourth era, um, their anti-imperial sentiment was high. That's, you know, ended up biting them in the ass and they got replaced. Yeah, and you can imagine that. Like, it's it's easy. Like, everyone wants to pin their problems on someone. And I mean, Hlalu, House Hlalu did cause a lot of problems. And, it, you know, it's the perfect scapegoat, really, if you think Well, the think big about thing it. is, like, yeah, they just... Under, like, instead of all of the houses like standing you know again against the imperial sort of thing the halalu were the most open to it and they were taking constant advantages of working with the times with the imperials rather than the rest who were like you know some of the more fundamental houses like indora was so powerful that even when they did get whittled down a bit in the third era they still remained you know had a lot of power but um house uh dress particularly also lost a bunch of power because a lot of house dress is sort of traditional kind of um, rights and so on were, you know, helped being preserved by House Inderil. Um, but when House, you know, basically when the Empire came along and then they signed the armistice and they agreed to be part of the Empire, a whole bunch of House Inderil's highest officials offed themselves and committed suicide because, um, you know, it was shameful and they would never want to live under under the Empire's uh, thumb and then so therefore house dress kind of lost a bunch of their greatest supporters and so on because you know the they were left with the indorils that are a little bit more well, i that, guess uh, i guess that's yeah. kind of interesting about Hlalu is that you can kind of view them as being you know kind of a, a, a more basic house compared to some of the others but 
really they were they were pretty much the only ones with any real progressive values and it obviously put them at odds with a lot like especially with house dress because you know they have a financial reason you know they have all their plantations and slaves and they have a good reason to not want to embrace any change and then you've got house lalu who eventually you know you've got a dunma king who outlaws slavery which is a pretty big deal you know that's going pretty far into the timeline but mm. yeah a, a lot of their a lot of their plantations relied on that slavery obviously you know we can say it's a bad thing or whatever but they're not economically viable anymore so when and halu they even gave kind of like um not territory to the empire but kind of, they were very hospitable like they just let them kind of like yeah well know, the biggest thing post up in there like, like examples of like Balmora was a house redder and thing and then it gets taken by Hlalu and they basically like Hlalu was on these massive territory grabs and so on because they had the um support of the empire and they had like um i'm pretty sure it's Hlalu that dominates the ebony trade and then there was like they were just able to massage themselves into this position where they were benefiting and that's the, the biggest problem i think from the view of the other uh, Dunma houses is that they look at Hlalu like these sneaky little traders because Hlalu, if they could, would have just kept all of the, you know, all of the slavery, all of their own values, everything they wanted. But um, they, you know, s sneakily just used, they just basically like, it's a kind of like pretending to be like progressive and so on in that kind of sense. So they would just, they basically just didn't have any values. They were just flexible with whatever benefits them the most. You know what I mean? Yeah, they. If you if you go and you look at um, the law behind what they actually got, they actually used the empire to get favors and got awarded like all these rich ebony mines. Yeah, well, not like, only that, like things like this and and fertile lands where they could grow. So I, different I guess things. it might be important to just tell people that like, to so they can probably understand Morrowind's structure. So so. Let's talk about it all post Nerevar and so on when there's the sort of great houses system and everything and then bring them up to speed. So generally there were so there were these great houses and there's sort of a council of big council that has members from all of the highest members of the great of the great houses and they come together and they sort of talk about things and so on. But then you also have the tribunal which is above them, which are like, you know, the three tribunal gods. And they've obviously like you know, they're a borderline that they kinda are a theocracy really. Like the you know, the gods and the priests cast rule everything but what happened is when they were basically um forced into the armistice with the empire uh tiber septum introduced uh a, like basically an imperial monarchy which is a separate separate sort of um power in, in um it's basically like a, a a representative of imperial and um Dunma like kind of uh, alliance I guess so they started off like one of the first examples is um Baron Zaya who was made like you know like the queen of Mournhold kind of thing and then she uh, you know there was stuff going on there because basically he if you look in Baron Zaya's story Tiber Septim sort of pulled her away from destruction and, and then sort of groomed her into becoming this kind of um Basically, yeah, Queen for Mournhold. So you establish a sort of dynasty, and there were like examples of Duke, like a uh, it's a thing's Vadim Dren, who was like who was a House Slalu member, and he became the Duke of Morn, um, Duke of Mournhold. And then you had like obviously Baron Zaya's child with um, Samachus, who was one of who was a dark elf, but a general um, of Tiber Septim's army, married Baron Zaya, and they had a kid together, and that kid was Helseth, who was King Helseth of. Morrowind. So they had this. So the Imperials were kind of like slowly trying to um, put out their, uh, like, control it by creating a, a creating a, a monarchy. And you know, Hlalu was very accommodating. So this monarchy was basically made up of Hlalu members. So you know, everyone else didn't like this. The parent, the power balance was slightly being, you know, fed towards Hlalu yeah. over the last four hundred years in the Third Era. So. Um, Mm. But then, yeah, so then that's a lot of the reason you have that um, animosity between the houses. I mean, I'll give you I'll give you a quote from like a kind of Hlalu teaching that really sums them up well. Mm. Although in some ways you could say they destroyed their reputation and it didn't stick to what they wanted. But it says, in the great wind of progress, tradition cannot stand. Grasp fortune by the forelocks. When you see your chances, seize them. When you see a chance to turn a profit, take it. But do not follow money blindly. There is value in reputation, more than many young Hlalu realize. 
This value must be carefully balanced against the more tangible coins in any deal. Theft and murder are bad for business. You can steal from someone, but will he trade with you after that? You can't bargain with a dead man. So they seem very like pragmatic and basically like the ultimate sellouts in the sense that like, their main goal is just like being prosperous and making money and throwing tradition away because they believe it can't stand anyway, so they don't care about it. Yeah. Um, but obviously they got a very bad reputation well, and, yeah. um, by the end of it. But, you know, they had their big reign with lots of power well, that's, too. So. That's things that, you know, they're about like, it's taking measured risks, but kind of like risks that go out of the norm that would be accepted. So, you know, when things do go bad, they're going to be the ones who get the spotlight, especially, you know, because at the end of the day, it's, like, it's, it's terrible timing because you have the tribunal disappear shortly before some major catastrophes, you know, with, a, with a, um, an oblivion crisis and you've got um, Red Mountain erupting. Um, so when that happens and you had all of the Imperials just completely pull out of your province and not aid you in your, you know, in your time of need, <laughs> you know, you know exactly who you're going to... Yeah you know um punish for it it's interesting that they're actually um just i guess we can continue and we'll we'll start talking about hell out house lowly because we've already sort of started on it but one mm. of the biggest hypocrisies of them is so they'll like have really close ties with the east empire trading company imperial stuff we know that and then they've actually one of the only houses with like senior members being non dunma so they started introducing like you know they're opening their house to to the more cosmopolitan values and so on but at the same time they've got really close connections with the Kamonatong, which are the most like xenophobic criminal organization in they in fact um the leader of the Kamonatong in the time of morrow in the game is the brother of duke vadim dren who is who is a you know high-ranking lalu member and duke of mornhold and obviously all for imperialization it's just fun to see that kind of like conflict and kind of like they don't have any you know, obviously there'll be, that's on a greater scale, like not talking about each individual, like obviously some individuals truly think it's good or bad or whatnot, but it just, you know what I mean? Like people look, outsiders yeah. looking in would be like, you're just the biggest hypocrites, like just doing whatever benefits Whatever you. fills the coin purse, basically. Yeah, exactly. So, you know. I think that's going to be a common I mean, the problem theme with where that... power resides, isn't it? We're going to see a lot of this. Yeah, yeah. But the, the problem as well with that is when you have that focus that's kind of, I don't know if I'd say anti-tradition, but just like, you know, less care for it. You do end up with just less mor morality in general. So it's like, well, this member of House Hlalu will go behind the back of this one if it benefits them and they won't get caught. It just, I know other houses can be like that, but it just creates an environment kind of where that can happen. In a way, easily. it's kind of, it's picking the picking the winning side as well, because, you know, for, for a great part yeah. of history, um, you can imagine most of the Dunma people would look at their um, their demigod tribunal as just like you know they're unassailable. You can't you can't go against them. They're they're you know they're all powerful. And then you've got Tiber Septim come along and kind of you know like they, they Tiber Septim doesn't conquer Morrowind, but kind of you know he also doesn't get completely sent away with his tail between his legs either. He she really you know shows himself to have some strength, and they kind of come to agreement. So it's like. You know, he's almost on par with them to an extent. And you can see why Hlalu would be like, oh, could be very beneficial to kind of get in this guy's good books. Yeah. And like, um, I, I do like also how, and if you think about them in the fourth era and where the Hlalu continue to go, they're heaps sour. <laughs> like they, um, in Ravenrock, yeah. they try and like, you know, um, perform coups against House Redoran and so on. And they're still trying to like, you know, dig their dig their hands in because they're, they're not a great house anymore on the on like the big grand council thing because how sadras replaced them but still they're around like they exist in some capacity well they try to pull off an assassination yeah. don't they? yeah uh, i mean you know salty but yeah i the salty house uh, lalu is uh yeah they're, 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 even even if you think about them from the gameplay perspective out of house redoran um and uh telvani and lalu Lalu feels the sort of like thief assassin archetype anyway, and Red Ran the warrior archetype, Tilvani Mage. Like, so. Yeah, well, yeah. that's what I quite like about House Red Ran is that they're, just, they've, they're kind of just consistently no nonsense and have, you know, they manage to, even when times are get looking rough, they're, you know, things don't fall apart and they kind of come together and actually sort shit out, which is, which is kind mm. of refreshing. But Red Ran are good. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because even, even House Telvani aren't really like that. 
you know, it, it is kind of unique to Red Iran in the sense that they do care about each yeah, other. Yeah, well, Telvani is so... Like, Telvani are very, like... You know, they, they work together, but it's very much well, like... Well, if you're going to... I just like the do what I the want. The most, like, pious houses, the most ones that benefited the most and enjoyed um, the the theocracy there under the tribunal, it's definitely um, Ind House Indrail and um, House Redoran. And I think House Redoran also... Like, I guess we could start talking... Which one, Indrail or Het Redoran first? Should we dive Let's go Red. I feel like Indoril is going to be a bigger one, so okay. perhaps we'll get onto that one after. So Redoran have like historically, um, they've had the sort of western border with Skyrim and all the land around there, and they've been kind of like treated as the sort of stalwart um, defenders of um, of, of Morrowind because they've just and they're these seasoned warriors. They're constantly fighting off Nordic invasions and raids and stuff throughout their history. And they've kind of formed, like, I guess the backbone of of um, the military and so on. And you'll even see them in, like, you can see the sort of, like, they quite they took quite a liking to Vivek in the way that Vivek had professed a lot of, like, um, chivalry and, like, sort of knightly values. And um, a lot of Red Aran members actually make up a majority of the buoyant armages, which is Vivek's personal own... Um, like knights, order of knights, essentially. And yeah, a lot of them, you know, Red Aran, um, along with Indril, put a lot towards the ghost fence and sort of like the kind of like the Dunma Greater Good. Like you can tell like their, their whole like, you know, you can look at their code, the things like, you know, duty, piety and gravity and like taking taking things very serious. You know, they're not like, you know, jokesters. Well, it's a fairly <laughs> consistent theme. I think like in the Elder Scrolls in general, that location and geography kind of impacts the, the race or the culture that develops there. And, you know, like um, if you looked, if you look around Mournhold, kind of central Morrowind, it's, you know, it's not the most hospitable place in Tamriel, but it's, you know, it's quite a nice area. And when you look at like Meryn's Dagon being a corner of the House of Troubles, who's, you know, he's he's the environmental problems and um house red around for the, for a lot of their area as you said kind of like they're constantly in conflict with the nords um in the velofi mountains but then they've, they've just got really some very inhospitable frozen sections that you wouldn't think about when it comes to morrowind but it's you know bordering skyrim so it's very mm. harsh and cold there yeah and I love the line, a light, careless life is not worth living. Like, I do like them sort of... And you can imagine them looking down on things like Klaalu. And, and to be honest, I can... There's, It's not like all of the houses get along entirely. Like, to, I'm sure they would look at a lot of the, um, you know, sort of luxury and stuff of House Inderil, um and, and the riches and, and stuff of the, of the temple and sort of, you know, look down on it a bit because they're not... Mm. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. You know what I mean? They don't... <clears throat> They are, they're like a, a, a modest house and they like to design things seriously, but simply, you know, like it's even reflected in their architecture style. It's, you know, built from local materials and kind of just like nothing too fancy. Yeah, they've got some... It, it, it's, it's pragmatic, it's sensible, it's sturdy, it works, but they won't go beyond that to make it all crazy decorative and like over the top and i i really like like a bunch of their bone mold armor is really cool and like the red around watchman yeah. helm and stuff like that like i mean if you looked like that and had that armor and you can consider that sensible and not over the top why would you want to go beyond it yeah. do you really need to make it gold plated it's pretty cool already yeah but like house so i don't know what else to um because house for red around is the most easily understood one for sure um yeah, they're probably my favorite. If I if I had to pick a favorite, it would be them or Tel. I mean, Telvani's really cool. Yeah. Sometimes you can forget how cool they are and take them for granted. But I I don't know. I just like the in a province that's filled with so much like um, backstabbing and questionable things. It's nice to have that consistent house who stays true to who they are and they're kind of like the mm. the mm. good guys. It's, it's, it's the honor. I was just going to say, like the the mod yeah. Tamriel rebuilt. If you know, if you've got Morrowind and you mm -hmm. you're interested in modding it, absolutely download that mod because they do flesh out a large part of the um, the west side of Morrowind. Um, and if you look at Blacklight, there, you know, ca capital city, it's it's so beautiful. It's like if, if that's what it does look like in the lore, and you know, if it's ever shown officially, I hope it looks something like that because it looks amazing. Yeah, yeah. But they're um I, I do I do like Redoran a lot, but I feel like the, I just the other ones have more like 
zing fat because it's very like you know it's they're all like very uh admirable values and so on but they're pretty straightforward a lot of their architecture and like aesthetics are cool but also their symbol they're like crest is awesome but um yeah would well, you want to move to Inderil now or you want to like yeah uh, i mean Inderil's kind of telvani in there uh, Inderil's kind of important anyway so should, we should kind of like talk about it so i mean that that all starts so house Indira was like a thing before like you know nerevar marries into it, marrying um alma Alexia. so um and becoming indoor nerevar and obviously like you know the ordinators are almost you know synonymous like basically all Indoril, and they have the visage of their greatest hero indoor nerevar on their face and they are the most closely linked temple with uh, uh, sorry, most closely, closely linked house with the temple, the tribunal temple. And if you, it, it's it's a funny, like I pointed this out in the, in the ordinator video, but it's a funny um, irony when you kind of, ba basically to what is the truth of the tribunal that they betrayed Nerevar and, and, you know, stole power and so on. But because of the doctrine and story that they've spun and they've even like, you know, honored Nerevar and honor him through all of these, you know, tales and stories and, and, and motifs and stuff like that, that all of these ordinators are walking around wearing Nerevar's face, protecting gods that they that betrayed Nerevar in the first place. You know what I mean? But obviously they don't know that. This is stuff that just gets carried on in Ashland and mm. myth. And and they're predominantly very much the religious house. Yeah. Like if you had to pick a religious house, this is it. And we, we were talking about before, and I guess we should just bring it up for everyone, this kind of idea that they're always involved with whatever the religion is. Mm. So when everyone's really just all focusing on the good Daedra, um, and, and, you know, that's the main focus of society. They're all about that, right? But then, obviously, they come to review the tribunal. Well, the tribunal well, are very I think smart, it's... weren't they? Because I think they, um, you know, everyone worshipped the good Daedra, but the, the tribunal knew they couldn't just come in and replace them, which is kind of why you yes. get the idea of the anticipations, right? It's because, you know, yeah. there's no tribunal without the good Daedra. The good Daedra led to this, so this is just the natural next step. You know, um, so yeah. it, it really it preys upon everybody's love for the good Daedra. Well, it, yeah, and and this this takes place over a very long time too. So like it's so it's not like they're they're like you know doing some kind of flip. It's more just like a slow adaption into the next. Step. Yeah, well, like for 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 them, like I don't think originally, like pre tribunal, that that Indoril was necessarily the like hyper religious like everyone was very like religious and all for the the good daedra thing but everything happens as a natural progression so you know once you know they're all into following indoral nerva obviously he becomes the center point of this new religion and it's kind of like you know the tribunal coming and becoming gods is like the coming of christ it's sort of like the you know um like you've said before drew the it's like the new testament to to the old testament you know all of the good daedra were positioned as the anticipations these sort of like crueler ancestral forms of um of the golden age tribunal that had to come like more civilized gods they're going to bring them into a new age and that's what really intertwines in inderil with them but if we just go all the way fast forward to the collapse of the tribunal and when they're decried as the false um emperor as as a sort of bid to hold on to as much power as they as they kind of had the, because the house had lost so much power with the tribunal they kind of really did become synonymous with um the the new temple like of the faith so now yeah. they they don't a lot of their you know they say to join the temple is to join Indril, and that's what one of the priests say in um in Raven Rock, but it's it's like it, I think it's like a bit of a, a natural <laughs> a coping mechanism to hold yeah, on. Yeah, I was power. about to say that <laughs> well, you, you can see yeah. a lot of parallels um, to Christianity because you, you know you have this idea that um, Nerevar, um, you know the the great houses can elect a hortator to kind of lead them in times of need, and um, you know Nerevar steps into this position. He, he becomes you know Azura's like chosen one basically. And, you know, when, when he sacrifices himself, even though, you know, he was kind of um, brutally murdered, um, you know, the, the tribunal, even though they were responsible for it, they were they, they were kind of like Judas. Um, they essentially became his disciples and like, you know, they, they were spreading that good word onwards and then, you know, ascending as they did so. And it's hard to deny them at that point. It's, 
it's what makes really good world building when you can look at it and you can go like there's a lot of like hindu bits in there and trappings and stuff like that but there is a lot of like abrahamic sort of judaism sort of stories and themes in there like if you read the 36 lessons of vivek like you basically have sort of like the hortator like so in nerevar in the sense and obviously any future nerevarine kind of thing that's going to come and rise to that position but is sort of like the the jesus kind of element like the prophet and then and you've kind of got like the shama as like this this is devil figure this satan and so on this whole time so you've kind of got this like you know biblical opposition and so on and don't worry you know and you know the nerevarine prophecy like mm. you know he's going to come again um Hortador and defeat the Sharmat and you know what I mean and like there, there's a lot of biblical sort of elements in there and then you also like factor in that they have like a whole catalogs a funny word for it but of saints like a catalog of saints like but there's all of these different saints that they have like there's a lot of there's a weird mixture of of things it's like quite alien but then there's all of the sort of um you know traditional kind of European things to latch on to like knightly orders and saints and stuff like that and it's just a really cool mix but um i guess we'll, we'll so indra was like super powerful basically like they were the most dominant house for for pretty much forever right up until the and, and that served and that served a lot of other houses mm. in terms of just like promoting dunma culture and the and dunma ways especially against hlalu's kind of like you know desire for more imperial culture mm. yeah absolutely because and, and as we said at the start Obviously, Indoral is a big help to dress. Yeah. And so, with Indoral, you know, past its glory days, uh, dress is going to be in a lot of trouble as well. Yeah. And so, like, and that, that's the other thing, like, you know, talk about, like, uh, I guess, because everyone, no matter what I think, it you can see, in, especially across all, like, fictional characters and everything, no matter the culture, really, you can kind of, everyone kind of gets this sense of there's, there's an admirable, admirable, um, something to admire about them is that they they sort of st like stick to their values or to their guns it's kind of when you see the samurai like committing suicide the seppuku stuff and and like that's kind of like a not my flavor i don't want to do that <laughs> but you can see how it's like a very honorable like conviction is a very like um it's kind of like a, a beautiful thing like it can i mean it can be a destructive thing but it's so when you see in, in I, I really do like the story of like the higher up members of um, Inderil actually like sticking to their guns and they're like, I'm not going to live in this. You know, they felt betrayed by the tribunal. I'm not going to live in this Morrowind under under Tiber Septum. And then they all kill themselves. But uh, I like how that, you know, had uh, carry on effects and changed the um, the the politics because now you don't have all of these like hyper conservative members of yeah, I mean, ultimately, it's super bad for the house. Mm. Like, as much as... I mean, you could argue that the house is kind of, like, screwed anyway. Yeah. And that they're not going to... So, and they know that, which is why they choose to, uh, you know, not stick around. But, yeah, the ones that left would be the weaker-willed ones. Or just a lot of them. Not Maybe not all of them. Maybe some were really, like, um, had strong convictions, but just knew that, like, you know... Uh, leaving is just not going to help mm. yeah you yeah. can see how this kind of becomes just a giant melting pot of problems that allows the argonian yeah. invasion to be so successful up until they hit redoran you know it's just um so many things going wrong for them on so many fronts and you know their most powerful house kind of you know self-destructing when they lose their you know their gods yeah because um yeah even house dress loses a lot of land and stuff because of that if you actually like because in the fourth era it, the, we don't know as much we can only get like hearsay from raven rock stuff like that but they seem to be like the dominant great house in the future mm -hmm. which is in which house red red red. yeah because dress yeah, are like yeah, right yeah. on the front lines aren't they so you know yeah. and they're not only that but they're probably the biggest target for all the Ar argonian anger too <laughs> so oh absolutely and the most convenient target because they're right mm. down there and I mean, that's why they were also successful when they were down there, because it was very convenient for them to go to the border of Black Marsh to take Argonian slaves. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, on the opposite end of that, you're the, you're first in line when the Argonians tear through Morrowind and start And they're bolstering everyone. their numbers as they liberate each, like, plantation, you know, with a bunch of new slaves. Just, yeah, you know, take exactly. A weapon. 
Right, I, yeah. I've said this plenty of, of plenty of times before, but I'm just like, how could they have not conquered all of Morrowind? <laughs> like the things they had working yeah, for uh, them. They had there's this basically a, a volcano apocalypse. You've loss of um, loss of gods, completely weakened um, all around because of the Oblivion Crisis as well. And then it's kind of like they still get stopped by just House Redoran. I know House Redoran's like you know the backbone of the military and they're strong, but the fact that they couldn't get past the South is still... Do you know what I mean? Like, Andrew... Yeah, go... You know, yeah. I was going to say, go look up my video, Are Argonians Weak? Where I basically go through all of their military efforts mm. throughout the timeline and kind of, you know... I mean, you, and, you, you all know I like Argonians, but they kind of do fail time At the end of the day, again. too, is like the... The virtue of like a, of of a people or something is not necessarily always in their ability to conquer and conquest. So it's not like... Um, going, oh, that makes them. Yeah, bad it's like oh, because, they're bad yeah, because they suck at conquesting Morrowind. But it's like, it's just that because of that one Daedra line, that they um, seem to be like everyone's like, oh, they're like the most powerful race and so on. And I really feel like it's just not the case. Well, we have speculated before, and it makes a lot of sense that they're just the further they get from the heart of Black Marsh, the weaker they become, and the less mm. capable they are of adapting. And they, you know, they don't have connection to their overseers and um yeah I, it doesn't surprise me that they would have been stopped honestly and, and and i mean even if you look at the kind of when you're getting into the north and you've got vardenfell and you've got all the uh, the telvani controlled regions i feel like that you know that they'd struggle a fair bit to deal with with these houses hmm. what's well, fun i mean it's, it, it is it is sad for an argonian that if you think about it you finally liberate you know your brothers and sisters from slavery but at the end of the day you're kind of a slave to the hist like you just can't yeah. you can't escape this label yeah the um house telvani also got uh copped a bit because originally before the dlcs came out the only hint to telvani was um if you go to i think it's a uh, branche you go do that quest for him in rift and you get a book you find a book for him and you find out that it reveals his past on this crashed ship that he was like an escaped Telvani thing and it was sort of implying that the house was destroyed. Oh, was he on the pride of Telvani? Yeah, I'm pretty oh, sure. He wasn't. No, he wasn't, he was. but the book was that you go there to, to get it. You read yeah, it and right. it's basically giving something along the lines of like, you know, one of the last like escaped house Telvani things. But then obviously when you get to Raven Rock, you see Neloth there and it's like, no, Telvani's like, you know, they're alive and well, but obviously smaller but like if you really think about it like if you go through all of the modern houses you've got um okay halal slalo is gone replaced by sadras but th that also just by being a newcomer i sort of assume they have a lower level of power dress has had their territory just walked all over but then again it's been like over well over 150 years since argonian um in the argonian invasion like this is a long period of time for it to happen but isn't there some quote about them still patrolling around and stuff? I'm not sure how far like that goes forward into the future, though. Like, I'm sure they're still mm. like attacking, doing things at the bottom. I know that they assaulted Raven Rock at some point earlier in the history. I'll have, you'll have to find it. But like the um, but then you've also got House Inderil, which is basically withered and kind of just become the temple. So they've just the Reclamations Temple is almost just House yeah. Inderil. So they don't really have the same power they used to. Telvani obviously has has shrunken and so on. So the only real big power there is Redoran left. Like there is no one else to really compete with them. Like maybe they're holding, yeah. hey, look, it's uh, e evolution. And like they, they've always focused on being hardy and sort of duty, honor and, and you know, withered the storm. I uh, weathered the storm, sorry. And um, and all the other houses have fallen except, well, you know, into, you know, weaker positions. Yeah, yeah, well, they've had countless centuries of dealing with the Nords in the height of the mountains, and now they've got kind of like fairly disorganized Argonians roaming around. And I imagine that much of central and southern Morrowind is potentially even still contested ground. But I, I highly doubt the borders will, the borders of Morrowind and Black Marsh will change drastically because, you know, at some point, um, so the strength will kind of. Um, they'll galvanize and kind of push back. And eventually, I imagine that the Argonians will settle to kind of retreat to where it's swampy and where other armies really struggle to to infiltrate. You know, I feel like that's and, inevitable. Mm. I mean, Argonians aren't really like um, conquest based anyway. They've never been the type to like swarm into a new territory and want mm. to build there. I mean, the whole modern Argonian philosophy anyway 
it's not supported to build architecture based out of Morrowind's um, like mm. environment. Well, that like if 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 Argonians are like, oh, we're gonna live in you know mud huts and reed houses. What do you you know? Like it's it's just their whole. I, I feel like they're just there. Yeah, for yeah. Like their whole core religious philosophy, anyway, is really like live in the present, don't fear erasure yeah. in the future, and, and you know, and stuff like that. But that's why I think it's the um, Anzalil um, political party sort of gained power, and that sort of seemed like that was the kind of like, you know, galvanization to get them to go up there and like get revenge and and attack. Whereas I don't feel like that. Um, Cause it's funny because like they actually had just outlawed slavery like a couple of years mm. prior. Uh, yeah, but that didn't actually stop at all. What do you mean? No, no, of course it's not gonna stop at all, but I'm just saying it's like the, the I guess the worst time for revenge. It's like they finally, it finally did. Like Helseth outlaw, um, the rumors are from oblivion that Helseth outlawed slavery. So slavery's outlawed the time of oblivion. And then you've got like, I think it's like five years and they, because the Argonian invasion just happens after Red Mountain. It's about five, six years or something. So in about five or six years of like slavery being outlawed and peeled back, they just go on in. Yeah. Although I guess in a sense, whether or not they considered it um, with Hlalu kind of being kicked out of the, uh, the great houses that the, the abolition of slavery, I don't think would last too long in a prospering Morrowind without Hlalu. Mm. I feel like it wouldn't I, yeah. take long. And I mean, they don't follow it anyway. Like, Telvani's not yeah. going to follow it. Like, maybe Dress would. Telvani would just be like, no. I, to be honest, <laughs> like, like, I'll do I, what I, I want. have a feeling. Like, I've got mixed things. Like, this is something that's weird. It's still a point of, like... I, I haven't seen any, like, strong, strong evidence for either way. But, like some people sort of treat Morrowind as if it's still part of the Empire, but I really don't think it is. Like, the whole DLC, Dragonborn, kind of gives you the impression that it's not. But in that sort of same way, like, they don't have a king or um, anymore, like an imperialized sort of monarchy or anything. So I, I kind of, like, you know, Mournhold was just destroyed. So I'm sort of like, I don't really... Um, I don't, I don't I don't think they're being ruled by the Empire, and therefore I feel like they will get back to some more traditional roots. And I feel like that's the way it's going just with the reclamations and the resurgence um of the good daedra like there would be people would be looking back like they'll be looking back beyond the the false gods and so on and really getting like you know and especially you know how like in times of crisis people really do tend towards um religion more because you know it helps them yeah deal with and it. a tradi traditionalist parties usually go well sorry it's like, we, I said traditionalist parties tend to go well. It's kind of like we need to return to our roots because that's what made us great in the mm. first place. Yeah, and, and as like straying from that is what caused our Especially downfall. when you think, you know, they, they, they were kind of founded on Boethius' teachings of kind of like overcoming the, the tests. You know, you've got mm. the, the House of Troubles that are like the embodiments of tests they have to deal with. And they're being tested at the moment. So, it, you know, that, that's when they should theoretically thrive is is in a time like mm. now is just to come back hard and yeah like come back with the good daedra not with any progressive values but exactly what the daedra said thousands of years ago yeah but then it, oh, on sorry, the, so i was gonna say on the other side we don't know just how weakened morrowind is like we're not aware of the full state of things like how like what does it look like how ash covered and just destroyed and like well, downtrodden we is can see morrowind. that red mountain is still fuming so i can you could kind of imagine that vardenfell at least would sort of just be constantly having like those same ash storms that you experience in in morrowind the game but like kind of all the time mm. but whereas like there's probably other areas are probably fine like it's obviously not going to be the same as if it just blew up because it's been you know, nearly 200 years. Like, it's been like a, what, 194 or something years like that since um, it exploded. And also the Argonian invasion happened soon after that. So, like, Morrowind has had, you know, over 100 years to recover. You know, even if all of the damage things really sort of, you know, carried on for, say, you know, right up until, like, year 80 of the fourth era or something, it's had all of this other time. Look, here's the thing. That's true. And like, that is a long time to heal. Mm. Like if you go look at like, you know, societies that get destroyed and annihilated, that is a long time to recover. But the way Skyrim's written makes it all feel so recent. Mm. And even not besides just the refugee crisis in Windhelm and how like you reflect and you're like, wait, they've been here for like a hundred years and they still kind of, you know, yeah. the Nords and the Dunma haven't integrated. There's still like this big criminal like community and like there's still heaps of tensions and problems but then when you go to solstheim it just 
feels very recent. You know, like I think the bi- the, the big kind of gave them soul the slime. biggest most beneficial retcon to Skyrim storyline would be like putting it setting it like you know, 30 years after Oblivion instead of 200. Because then you could just have all of these events sort of happen. They feel like more um, tangible and you can see the ripple effects of these things without thinking that like, oh, it's been 200 years. It's like too long. Do you know what I mean? That's kind of the thing with the Elder Scrolls timeline in general is there are so many points in history, you know, much more egregious examples where you can see just hundreds almost thousands of years past with kind of nothing really going on and no major changes. It's almost like, you know, the way things advance and progress in this universe is just nothing like I th- it, it is for I th- us. I think I said on Twitter or something, you could take like the nearly 3000 years of, of the first era and condense it to about 1400 years. And it would still, ha- still have that sense of like pace. Like, I think it's all comes mm. from like a lot of like roots in fantasy is like Lord of the Rings has this massive timeline. It's huge. And it's thousands of years go by and characters live for all of these thousands of years. But if you want it to like to feel more like close to, to, to realism is like things change really quick. Like look at the last hundred years. It's kind of like how like, uh, you know, like the, the age of knights in full plate armor and gleaming and so on. Like that kind of lasted for a hundred years and then guns came about and was gone. So that was like a hundred years of, you know, technology. But what I'm saying is even if you apply this to a fantasy sort of mentality, you could like double the amount of time, triple the amount of time. And it's still such a shorter timeline by comparison to to Elder Scrolls mm. or yeah I, I think yeah I mean I, yeah mm. yeah it's just it's, it's just a cool um, little thing I think you'd you know oh, I was gonna say I was gonna say in Elder Scrolls 6 one of the good things about leaving a timeline open is that they can write books just about historical things that you've never heard of and date them in that timeline where there's space mm. like I still agree that they they definitely could condense mm. it right like absolutely could condense it but it is nice that there is space there so you can pick up a book and it's obviously not going to be something super world changing otherwise you'd be like why haven't i heard of this Mm. yet but you can just read a book about some battle or some skirmish or some war between two kind of like not, not provinces but like um districts or like two small territories that each had leaders you know Mm. back in some certain time period fighting in whatever province and it would be cool and they can just leave those little gaps there. Yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. But, um, yeah, so let's get back on track with the houses. <laughs> I guess we'll, we'll go to house dress. Then, yeah. Like, to just kind of give them a bit of a focus before we move to Telvani. So, um, house dress. Uh, massive uh, salt rice plantations. They, uh, they're a big... So, they're massive fans of slavery. They're staunch defenders of slavery because it's their main labor force. They basically capture Argonians and because Argonians have all like, you know, all different resistances, they're very adaptable. Um, they use them in these like massive, you know, salt rice fields and also like, you, you know, use them in mines where potential like, you know, toxic, mm-hmm. noxious gases and, and stuff like are there that they yeah. can survive. Like they, they, they're not, um, and it's not just a pragmatic thing or a financial thing. Like, they're also extremely xenophobic. Mm. So, how stressed they consider the Dunma to be above, you know, the other races. I mean, we should... Uh, I mean, a lot of Dark Elves do, but they really... Because we should throw us a disclaimer. Strongly believe that. Dunma are, like, one of the most xenophobic races, like, period, across all of them. So, it's like... like, Mm. But of that, of that, I just know, like, there's this... There's this um, quote from Understanding How Stress... Mm. And it's like the isolationist stance of how stress was instilled in its customs and world outlook from the very beginning. Not only do we consider the other cultures and races to be inferior to the Dunma, we deem any extended contact with them where we were not in total control to present a danger to Dunma society. Ideas like a plague can spread without warning and prove to be impossible to contain. Instead, we should concentrate on interhouse relations and improving the position of the Dunma to make our society stronger and eternal. Mm. So you can really feel that like traditional, like I don't even want ideas from other but races. Let I would alone say that that's probably the them. same, like just extrapolating. It's probably the same as um, House Inderil, for example, just based on and you could even extend it to uh Redoran to a degree just because like indra like mm. by virtue of being a theocracy you're like everything's dogmatic like you've got these gods and these gods that can enforce it and so on so it's all really 
rigid, like mm. no no heresy, you know, like everything that's not. Then then why do you why do you think how stress would label themselves as that? Then they must have some kind I mean, you of can ju- stronger or or what? Is it a competition? Like oh, I'm the most xenophobic. Well, no, I think counts. it's just uh, like if you read it, it, read like it just reads like it's their philosophy, which just matches up with some of the other houses, like like Inderil, for example. I think Redoran maybe a little less so, but even if you think about Redoran, like their dedication to clan, family, and duty and gravity and stuff like that seems like. A much more, um, and you know, obviously they're more entrenched with entrenched with the tribunal as I well. Mean, it's kind of a beautiful thing about the Dunmo is that they really they don't discriminate. That you know they'll enslave just <laughs> about everyone. You know, it's like yeah. they they mainly slave Argo, uh, enslave Argonians because it's easy. Khajiit, perhaps the next easiest, and perhaps they put them at the bottom. But they'll enslave humans as well. You know, you can find them in slave pens. Um, you know, um, in Telvanni territory even? a lot. And, so enslaved you know, tiles, slaved, yeah. I'm pretty sure even wood elves. Like there's, yeah, just anything goes. <laughs> like <laughs> they really see themselves as like the only, like, you know, out of the elven races as well. Like obviously, by the way, like this is a generalization of like times of their society and so on. Like there's always going to be individuals mm. that are against or for because... Yeah, like the twin lamps and all the other abolitionists. Yeah, kind but of even those kinds of abolitionist groups. kind of groups, they would not have existed before the armistice. You know, before um, the empire has any control. Like looking beforehand, it's. I mean, I know ESO put them in this, and like this is where we get to the whole Ebon Heart Pact kind of stuff, where only a few of the houses join, but then it's kind. Of, I, Look, I don't. I I still to this day think that the Ebon Heart Pact is like poorly done, just because. You, you know. have to take um, the law added. I, I don't just mean Elder Scrolls Online in general, but specifically Morrowind. I think you have to take it with a grain of salt, and perhaps even in Somerset, because realistically, say you've you've world built a very xenophobic race who don't mm. they consider anyone who comes in outlanders and kind of give them side eyes and whatnot. You can't make that work for your game if you have an MMO RPG. It's like it's not pos- so. You kind of you know you take everything with suspending your disbelief a little bit, and I think. The Ebon Heart Pact is kind of an example of that. It just annoys me because they could have had an MMO without doing that. That that's such a massive. And I know it's only a few houses, but I just, I just don't buy it that that, that these be long standing, thousand long year theocracy tribunal gods. They can defend themselves. No one can conquer them. The Reman Empire couldn't even do it after trying for eighty years. It's just sort of like then all of a sudden they're like, actually, we'll work with. Um, our, you know, our greatest enemies and our slaves, you know what I mean? And like work with them. Like, it just kind of sounds silly to me. And I know it's only Eastern Skyrim too, but I mean, Eastern Skyrim, if anything's the more like uh, conservative side of Skyrim. Yeah. Yeah. And the one they've had fights with and stuff. Yeah. It just, and I know they go, oh, for the pack, there's all these reasons, but what I'm saying, they're all cope reasons. They're all, it's like, all that happened was they could make sense with the Aldmeri Dominion. They could make sense with um, High Rock. Um, to a de- to a degree, like even the way they wrote in the orcs into that kind of thing, it was like a real. Um, I actually like how they did that because it was a very temporary thing, just to get to that. Uh, High King Emmerich was leveraging to get um, orcs, orcs to help him, so then he'd set them up with Orsinium, and like you know, it was a mutually beneficial kind of thing. And also that pact, you know, falls apart with the death of Kurog. But um, in the Ebonheart Pact sort of scenario, I just, I just. It, it's it's just they they're so ideologically opposed and, and they're basically just like oh we're gonna mash the other three races together somehow, you know and yeah. it's like unlikely alliance but I'm like yeah it is very very <laughs> unlikely like too unlikely. Do you think they could have done it differently huh? though? Do you think you could match? I mean the whole system is flawed anyway. But if I just you know a little fun challenge, I'm gonna force you to use their parameters and you have to make three alliances you know, each one with different races. Mm. How would you do it that that makes sense? I mean, sense? I don't like the alliance that... I don't like the story like that anyway. Like, I just... the Me too. I'm, I'm saying if you had to use their parameters, you can see how they were forced into it. Yeah, I think you could split them up differently. Like, why couldn't you do like a more... Yeah, that's what I'm asking. <laughs> Let's do it. So... I mean, you could go... Because the old Miri Dominion one makes a lot Sorry. of sense. The old Mary Dominion. But even the, to be honest sense, though, but the Khajiit right. thing, like it's even going back, but like it doesn't necessarily make like, you know, it, they did it because of the, where the Khajiit are in 
um, the Aldmeri Dominion in the future. But the Aldmeri Dominion yeah. Khajiit thing is very specific. Like they made the moons disappear and they sort of rebuilt the kingdoms and took them on as client states kind of thing. But if you went um, back, like you can get away with it. It's still not the most ideal. But I like, I don't know, even like... Um, Look. I don't know if Khajiit and Argonians, because it just literally the fact is some are not meant to be in alliances in together. Exactly. Well, but that's I why think I think so. that whole premise was they just did it for PvP. Yeah. They wanted to. Yeah, I, I the agree. The premise was a I bit agree. awkward I'm because, just... you know, it, it all kind of it did force you as well. If you wanted to play with, I think if you wanted to play with certain friends, you had to be a specific race or a group of races in each pact or whatever i think mm. might be initially Origi okay. originally but was, i mean like was, you know one thing that yeah, could it, it could work but at the same time i'm not a game dev but it's like you know you could potentially do you know high rock skyrim and cyrodiil versus um valen wood somerset and elsewhere and then you have the other three races as kind of independent factions i don't know but then you know then i'm not sure exactly how that'd work but i think the orcs being could, on their I own mean, yeah, you could have all kinds sorry? of yeah. yeah, you could. You could have all kinds of things. It's just, yeah, they want to... The, the, the biggest, like, throw-in in even thing is that clients. just in terms of, like, Morrowind's growth, like, by the time you get to the armistice and so on, it's supposed to be, like, you know, how Sindoral are all committing suicide after they would never do all of these kinds of things and interact with all these other races and have them have any degree of power. But by virtue of being in the Ebonheart Pact, the others are sort of, they're exerting a sort of power, a sort of cooperation over other houses... And like, why weren't they offing themselves when um, when they made that alliance with with uh, the Nords and so on? And like, yeah, in the same true. way, that it just it just doesn't stack up. And it's like the reason is also it's like the why. Like, there's a very good reason why they signed the armistice. It's because Dagothur had cut them off from the source, the heart of Lorcan, so their powers were waning. And they saw that, oh shit, we might not be able to beat the Empire. So let's actually make a favorable alliance now. And, you know, they saw that Tiber Septum was basically going to win. So they just played their cards right at the time. But there was a reason for that, you know. But when it, when it came to Riemann and they were sitting there fully powered, um, they were like, they kept on trying to knock him back. And you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we could probably move to House Telvani. Yeah. I'm kind of keen to well, talk about Well, I guess, you know, them. one way to link the two topics is I guess they at least kind of threw us a bone by having Telvani be the one house who are like they look at the Evan Hart Pact and like nah we're not interested you know much to the much to the chagrin of the other houses mm. um, and that you know that is a good way to in a sense sum them up that they, they wanted no part of that crap yeah yeah but then yeah I just I just start feeling like the same way as Scott now where I'm like well why would this oh, other house absolutely like they All should them, also yeah, just, yeah, slightly, it's just yeah. silly anyway House Telvani, the House of Magic. Mm. Let's get back on well, track. They got the most powerful mages and the coolest mushroom towers, and they are very much um, isolationist, and they don't care about others. And they'll even kind of do bad things to one another because of their whole belief system and their kind of motto. Yeah, they're really like it's a real dog eat dog world. It's like if you stole it and got away with it, you deserve it. If you if you beat him, then obviously your argument has the better merit. Like it's really is sort of a like you deserve it if you get it. Basically, if you were more cunning or you were uh, more uh, you know intelligent and you had the better plan or you know the more powerful magic, um, it's kind of a weird thing because it pits a lot of the house against one another. But they they're kind of like. The House Telvani is kind of like a... It feels, I guess, even more like the... the you know, we were saying like the Thieves Guild kind of feels like a, a union rather than like a tight, like, belief kind of thing. But they're all of these very isolationist, individualistic mages that sort of benefit preserving those protections by being a house. Well, in a way, it's almost like a dragon-like <laughs> mindset in that, you know, being the most powerful and being right... You know, being the most powerful is being right and, you know... In a, in a sense, you can kind of look at it like these are all very individualistic characters who care about their experiments and ex and expanding their knowledge. And they can benefit from having someone who they may hate in their own house, who's also a genius. And they kind of, you know, they're all, um, if they're advancing mm. their studies of magic and science or whatever, then, it, it, you know, mm. it's, I guess it's for the good of the race and the house and themselves. Yeah. And, and I think you, you can't, like, it's just more incentive to be isolationist. Like, if you are Telvani and you follow the whole wisdom confers power and power confers right ideology, you go off to study. 
I almost wouldn't want to live around lots of other powerful Telvani. They might just kill me because they want to or because, you know, they see me as a threat. Like it's very, you know, there's not a lot of uh, not a lot to be gained by being super social. Yeah. In house Telvani. It's worth noting that they're like the most uh, like sort of secular. Like, they kind of don't really care about the tribunal. Like you won't find many religious sort of uh Mm. people like you know they might be like base level but you know what i mean they're not like you don't find zealots among the telvani typically and they they send their mouth to their meetings for them they can't be bothered yeah like they have um not not their actual mouth they have like representative. A, a representative called the mouth yeah and it's cool and they've got so many eccentric characters like um oh my god i've completely one of the first one is a it's the it's the woman with the with the naked khajiit slave and all of the the gems aligned um I've forgotten her name, but basically she's just this absolutely insane um, Dunma woman, powerful mage. And then there's also exam like, you know, Dive Eighth Fear, of course, that he's cloned himself for mm. like wife daughters. And he's got like a dungeon, which he tries to encourage thieves to go and steal from. Um, but they can't, you know, they'll probably get killed. Like, he's, he's just got a, like a bunch of different things going on. And, and like, um, mm. yeah. And Dive Aethy is just really cool as a long-standing character. There's plenty of ancient wizards here, like, you know, because, you know, he's yeah. the oldest, supposedly, which is, like, over 4,000 years old at the time of Morrowind. So he was around even when they were Kaima. Like, he would have witnessed, like, physically witnessed being Kaima turned into a Dunma and, like, experiencing that. That would be crazy. But I'm sure there are plenty of yeah. examples of, like, oh, he's a thousand-year-old wizard. Oh, he's a 2,000-year-old one, you know? Mm. No, they are cool. Yeah, yeah and that's cool. that's one thing. It's like you know, you imagine their counselors meeting that they they would barely be able to agree with each other on anything. So it's almost pointless them getting involved in the in the politics of the other great houses because they're never going to see eye to eye with anyone, pretty much outside yeah. of their own tower. They they would be incredibly mm. unlikable. Like you love them in the games because that's how like games and movies can feel like that where unlikable. Like as in, if you lived in the world, they'd be unlikable characters. Are really cool. Yeah. But, like, if you actually had to meet and interact with them, yeah. Like, Neloth, for example, you'd be like, ugh, gross. Like, using his own <laughs> apprentices for bad experiments and, like, you know, I'll teach you magic and then, like, doing dodgy stuff to him. It's cool for a game. Yeah, well, I mean, you can imagine, you know, some of the other houses kind of suffer them because it's like, it, if we really need them and we can yeah. actually get them to help us out with something, you know, like, they lend their wisdom mm -hmm. or their power you know, for example, stopping an enemy and they actually bother to help, <laughs> then it's like, you know, you've got this really yeah. powerful wild card, except, you know, it's like you don't have the right gym badge so they don't obey you. It's just you hope that they do the right thing <laughs> to win you. It's kind of like a reluctant, like, court wizard that you just keep in the back pocket just in case you need him. Man, I, I really do like how, like, I think Morrowind really did, like, the politics and stuff really well because there's so many, like, cross sections. So, you know, how... Telvani, you know, they're all the isolationist kind of things, but they're very staunch defenders of slavery, which sort of makes them uh, naturally more so allies to House Dress. And House Dress is, um, you know, their biggest uh, offenders of slavery. And they do, um, and they, you know, all of their sort of agriculture and stuff. But then you've got that sort of cross section where Dress are very, very traditionalist, which crosses with sort of Inderil, which are very conservative and orthodox. And then you've got that, which crosses with House Redoran, who are like quite, you know, pious family sort of stuff. And that crosses with Inderil. And there's, I just, there's a lot of like, uh, just, you know, interconnectedness. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's hard not to fall yeah. in love with the Dunma and Morrowind above pretty much any other race in Tamriel because it's it almost seems like the amount of complexity of the relationships between the provinces is pretty much on par with the complexity of just the powers and politics in Morrowind itself you know it's so mm. detailed yeah. in so many ways that um, was it yeah mm. uh, I mean that's one of the best things about them is that not only are they you know when you die so there's some races that might look more plain but then you dive into them and you're like, wow, there's actually a lot more here than I thought. And they're really cool. Morrowind, uh, sorry, Dark Elves and Morrowind in general kind of just win on all fronts because it's like, not only is there a lot of complexity behind the scenes and in all the world building, but they're also just really aesthetic and like cosmetically cool as well. Like, you know, we use magic to build mushroom towers and the only way you can get up is with levitation or, you know, this uh, cheap press A in 
the DLC and just fly up there using whatever magical if, assistance that it has. If you think about it too, a lot of uh, um, the problem with a lot of other places is by comparison where they're just going to lose is they're either generally either a binary or or just a like a monopoly essentially. So like you know, Somerset Isles completely under the control. Of the Aldmeri Dominion, Valen Wood is kind of feels the same even like if it's not under the Aldmeri Dominion there's just lots of tribes and stuff maybe that would be cool but like um you know if you were elsewhere elsewhere got like cut into two kingdoms where you've sort of got north versus south in Morrowind you've got uh, sorry in Skyrim you've got like east versus west or storm close to empire whatever but basically conservative versus progressive exact same thing with Hammerfell you've got crowns and forebears it's just sort of the one or two whereas in in uh, Morrowind, you've immediately got five different things all vying for power, and then within them, they've got their own conflicts, and then you've got the temple as well, and then obviously, because of the setting, you have the Empire's interests all stuff coming in as well, and it's just this big intermixture of stuff, so... And the sixth house. Yeah, exactly. All kinds of stuff, yeah. Well, I guess... Uh, let's... Uh, we can touch on the sixth house a bit, which is... More or less, like originally, House Dagoth was was back when Dagoth uh, was around with Nerevar and stuff at the time. Like he was just another house of, of the Kaima House, but obviously, as he was either killed because he was a baddie or betrayed, or there's all the variations of battle at Red Mountain. But basically, he became sort of like the Shamat Dagoth, uh, the false dreamer. But basically, the Sixth House from that point onwards sort of became a, a cult dedicated. The way that you could frame it, you know how we were using the biblical thing before? Um, comparison, you can kind of treat it as like if the Shamat is there like Satan, you can imagine like the Satanist cults. That's kind of what the Sixth House is to the Dharma people. It's like, do you know what I mean? It would, that's that's the kind of vibe, like all pentagrams and stuff like that. Like that's the kind of vibes it gives mm. them. And that's kind of what they are. Like obviously um, when Dagothur is sort of returning in more so full power during the time of the Third Era, uh, the Sixth House is um, expanding a lot and they're smuggling like these sort of like ash statues and stuff to and, and getting into people's dreams and spreading his basically like his blight and his influence and, and stuff like that. But to be honest, they are kind of the baddie devil Satan cult house. But they weren't originally. It's just because their leader is the Shabbat. I, I, like, I like they have supposedly have this affinity for music and sound as mm. well. Like they have all these bells and and chimes well, and stuff that, at their shrines, which they use in rituals, and because it's um, pretty sure there's even a creature. Well, what it is is um, when you go into the Elder Scrolls. So the um, you know how the Elder Scrolls has music and stuff and visualizing on, and you know there's a tonal yeah, like everything's a song. Yeah, and the tonal architecture yeah. and the thorm and all of these things are sort of like musical oriented. So it's sort of talking about the fabric of universe as musical. You'll see the earliest sort of Ash zombie minions. They're they're like eye caves in kind of thing. And then it caves in more. And now you start getting like a tentacly looking um, sort of thing coming out of it. And then you, as they, you know, grow and grow and grow, they become the sleepers, which are like, you have more of those tentacles sort of all pulling out. And then they're long tentacles with like, um, like almost like a flute looking thing with like different eyes or, or whatever the instrument's called. Mm. Um, there's concept art. There's really cool yeah. concept art of like this big kind of like trunk creature with all these musical notes coming. Yeah, out. but it's like a reverse the sleepers. It's like the reverse um, enlightenment kind of kind of thing, which is kind of on theme with with the Shamat, which is the idea that he is he's like he dreams that he is real from the dream sleep. He's like awake in the dream. This is all very contrived and hard to get around, but it's basically that. He, um, he, he's in the dream sleeve, dreaming himself into existence. He's like awake in the dream mm. sleeve, whereas usually it's the reverse. That might be... In know. summary, we're going to have to have a Sixth House podcast eventually. Yeah. That's because like... The, perhaps. What's crazy about those guys is it like the Tribunal Gods and all the Battle of Red Mountain and Dagoth Ur is that you can continuously change your understanding and think more and more and more about it and like different stuff it's so um i like imagining the kind of the way these cultists essentially following dagoff um become it's kind of, it's kind of like reminiscent of the actual the story of you know you got the heart of lorcan which is kind of the constant beat that's going on that dagoff is you know very closely tied to and you know obviously the the tool kagranak's tools including um uh the hammer um what's the hammer Sunder, called again? So, yeah Sunder, and, keening 
and um, Wraith Guard. Yeah, yeah, and you know, kind of like yeah. the idea is tapping the um, the heart of Lorcan to kind of sync yourself up with it, and then you've got these chimes and the bell hammers that these cultists are using, and you imagine they're all kind of syncing up, and the magic is flowing the same way the blight flows through Morrowind, you know, as, as like mm. cleansing the land and all of this. It's it's very cool, but it gets very wacky. Yeah, yeah. No, I like that. Sounds good. <laughs> that it's definitely mad. I um. I don't know. Uh, we you can touch us House Sadras, but there's basically nothing to say outside of it's mentioned that they replace House Lalu. I think there could even be a, a Legends card. I feel like I've seen a Sadras yeah. agent, but I mean, you know, it's a Dunma. Yeah, it doesn't give you much. <laughs> it's a Dunma looking agent with a a blue sword. Uh, the sword is quite interesting. Is it a bound sword or is it it's something else? Or maybe that's their art of a bound yeah. sword. Kind of looks like Chillrend with ethereal stuff around it. I don't know. But yeah, Sadras Agent. Um, also, I guess uh, we should bring this up. And we've kind of brought it up a few other times in smaller parts. But how the sort of house politics interact. So the idea was in Kaima times, um, pre-tribunal that... Well, actually even a bit earlier. But basically the idea was that there was all these houses that were in all out. Um, war all the time like if you know if house red Ren wasn't getting along with indril they'll just go to war and so on and that's where you get the unique function of the morag tong um, that gets implemented and so on which is sort of adding this sort of uh third party to be to mediate all of the violently mediate all of the grievances between houses and it actually um leads to a greater stability of um of morrowind because they I mean, they've got two things going for them. They've got three gods to tell them what to do, so they've got to behave, but then also it gives them a sort of like a, um, a catharsis or something that I can get that person murdered because I don't like them or whatnot, you know? Yeah, it's a weird dynamic mm. when it's, you know, uh, the Morag Tong not just being a kind of, oh, you know, there's there's more to them than just pay me and I kill this person. It's, you know... Mm. Um, and you can imagine that that's kind of how it works. It's like, you know, they're, the great houses are kind of allowed to operate freely. and But then when, you know, certain individuals start pissing off too many people, like, you know, one branch of this big tree growing too um, crazy, then they'll just, then finally, the Morag Tong will come in and chop it off and kind of bring back a little bit of order. But yeah, it's a weird balance. It is a weird too. And I feel like it also like keeps them in... Um uh, and more so like it creates a power balance by having this sort of powerful assassin's third party that you can use to fight your opponents. It's like basically a weapon that everyone can use. So it's not like, oh, one has more military might, so they'll win or whatnot. And if you actually look into the fourth era, House Redoran, the one with a lot of military might and, and, and um, a lot of power has sort of become the very dominant house of Morrowind and sort of leading because there is mm. no check and balance to um, Redoran's power anymore. Mm. So... Um, you know, in interesting yeah. uh, reasoning for it. Don't know if I'd want to live in a society where the Morag Tong can show off my door no. and stab me, but... <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Anyway, I guess that brings us to the end, unless anyone th has anything else to say. It's been a, a good podcast. Always nice to talk about Morrowind. Yeah, pe people keep asking. One, like, we'll get to it. There, there's a lot of we keep putting off because there's a few more, like, not even simple... Uh, uh, there's a few more like simply complex topics that we can talk about that aren't the ridiculous complexity of things like the 36 lessons of Vivek. People keep asking for us to break those down, but like they're, it's just a lot. Like it's almost like a video might be better to do that in or like, I don't know, but it might be fun to do it like live and so on and like break it yeah, down. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I feel like it would be pretty fun. Like as long as we have like a, a good period of kind of like beforehand study and yeah like, you know going all into it and like getting well prepared yeah but yeah i'd be down to go yeah. through them i think it'd be and fun. then we can do you know the Sharmat six house kind of stuff kind of stuff <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah cool but yeah all right anyways thank you all for watching and our social media links are in the description and we look forward to nerding out with you all again very soon